Okay, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. So inshallah, today, uh, now, I will share with you uh, some interesting historical events that took place in the month of Dhul Hijjah. Of course, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made Hajj in the 10th year after Hijrah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this time of Dhul Hijjah is the correct Dhul Hijjah. And what this was referring to is that the Meccans had a tradition where they used to play around with the months. Because the three sacred months are together and there are four sacred months. What are the four sacred months in the Islamic calendar? Dhul Hijjah. Ramadan is not a sacred month. It is a sacred in its own way, but it is not one of the Ashar al Hurum. Dhul Hijjah. Muharram, Rajab, one more, Dhul Qa'ada, yes. So three of them are together, Dhul Qa'ada, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. And then Rajab, okay? Rajab is separate, and then Dhul Qa'ada, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. These are months in which fighting was not allowed. And until now, it has the sanctity that these are times that even you do not start any offensive conflict. But of course, defense is defense. That is, of course, you're not going to say, hey guys, we're not going to respond to you while you're attacking us until the sacred months are over. So, the Prophet ﷺ said that the Quraysh used to play around with the months because they could not wait so long to fight with someone when three months would come together. So when they wanted to fight, they would say, well, we are the Quraysh and we are kind of like the leaders of all the Arabs. So we are deciding that next month is not Muharram, next month is Safar. And the month after that will be Muharram. And it happened so many times where the people could not keep a record that which one is the correct Dhul Hijjah from the day that Allah had created the, the earth and the time had begun. From that time on, the Prophet said, it just so happens that this year, the months have fallen on exactly where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created them. So he said, from here on, no more changing of the months. Nobody can change the month now. Okay? The Amirul Mu'minin cannot decide that, okay, this month is Muharram and next month is this and, you know, you can't do that anymore. It is what it is. So, uh, in the sixth year of prophethood, the sixth year of prophethood, the uncle of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib becomes Muslim. He becomes Muslim after an incident which took place with Abu Jahl, where Abu Jahl saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out in public and he started insulting him. And he got so heated in it that uh, he picked up a rock and threw at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Prophet did not respond to him at all. So of course, the people who were seeing that they felt bad for the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't respond and this man did so much to him. So that one uh, slave lady, she saw Hamza coming in from the desert with, after hunting in the desert. And she said that, did you hear what Amr ibn Hisham uh, did to your uh, nephew? She sa he said, what? So she told him the whole story. He got so enraged that he had his bow and his sword and everything that he had just come from hunting, he went straight to Abu Jahl and he hit him. Uh, they say, some of the narrations say that he hit him with his bow. Some of the narrations say that he hit him with his sword's blunt edge. He hit him in his face that he started bleeding. He said, my nephew didn't even respond to you. And you insulted him in such a way. So of course this was a tribal society. And, and Hamza said, you insulted him, you know what? I am upon his religion as well. Insult me, go ahead, I dare you. But of course, he did not intend to say it, but now that he said it, he's like, well, I said it, I'm now a Muslim. So the subhanAllah, look at that the Prophet wasallam not responding to Abu Jahl's insult brings Hamza radiallahu anhu to become Muslim, right? So, uh, the people, the tribe of Abu Jahl gathered together and they said, you know what, how dare you hit our man? And Abu Jahl said, you know what, go home, leave him because indeed I did 
shamelessly insult his nephew. So, you know, just let's consider it even and leave it as that. Now, Hamza radiallahu anh becomes Muslim. Three days later, Umar ibn al-Khattab becomes Muslim. Both of these happen in Dhul Hijjah. Both of these happen in Dhul Hijjah. And uh, we know the famous story that when Umar was coming to kill the Prophet wasallam, he was diverted to uh, his sister Fatima bint al-Khattab's house. There he went, his heart was softened. He heard the verses of Surah Taha. And then he decided, he said, okay, tell me where is Muhammad wasallam." And they said, okay, he's there, so he's going there. Of course, they don't know what his intention is. They don't know what has happened in the house of Fatima yet. So they said, Umar is coming. And Umar was the person that was very big, powerful, uh, very loud. And the people used to just say, okay, we don't want to mess with him. So Umar radiallahu anh came and he basically asked permission to enter. And they said, Umar is coming. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So Hamza said, you know what? Open the door. Let him come in. I'm here. If he comes with a good intention, then welcome. But if he comes with anything else, then it will be the sword of Umar and it will be the neck of Umar. I will kill him with his own sword. Let him come in. How dare he come and uh, try to come and uh, attack the Prophet ﷺ. But of course, as soon as they open the door, the body language of Umar is completely subdued. And he's there to become Muslim. And they said that when Omar became Muslim, they became so happy and they made so much takbir that it could be heard in the Kaaba. And of course, Omar radiallahu anh said, if we are on the truth, why are we hiding? Why are we hiding? Why not we go and pray publicly? So the first day in the history of Islam, and this has been multiple years since the revelation, uh, according to some six years the Muslims have never prayed publicly. The Prophet himself can. But the Muslims as a group, they cannot pray publicly because they will be attacked. So on this day, Umar radiallahu anh leads one group and Hamza leads one group and they surround the Prophet wasallam. And as a group for the first time, they go to the Kaaba and they pray there in public. So this, both of these incidents, they happen in the month of Dhul Hijjah. In the 13th year after, before uh, the 13th year after Revelation, the second pledge of Aqaba takes place. The second pledge of Aqaba takes place. This is the time when 73 men and two women came from Medina and they pledged their allegiance to the Prophet. ﷺ. This is called the greater pledge of Aqaba. The earlier one, only 12 people were there, so they were a smaller group. But the Prophet said, Come back next year and bring more people with you. The Prophet wanted to see that is there just 12 people inviting me to come and come and live in Medina or is there wide support for this? So the next year they brought all of the influential people, 73 men and two women. They brought all of them and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we pledge our allegiance to you and we will fight for you like we fight for our women and our children. But they said, one thing we want to ask you. What if we fight for you and we die for you, and Allah gives us victory, are you then going to leave us and go back to your people in Makkah? So the Prophet wasallam said, no, I will live with you and I will die with you. I will make peace with those whom you make peace and I will make war with those whom you make war with. And this is of course the loyalty of the Prophet wasallam. right? You know, one of the things that is uh, very important when it comes to leadership is loyalty, right? Loyalty without crossing limits. So sometimes you have politicians, when they get elected, they forget their loyal supporters, right? And sometimes they get elected and they, they help their loyal supporters so much that they start to appoint people who are not qualified to positions and stuff like that just because of their loyalty. Our dean teaches us that you have to be balanced in there where you, you have loyalty is a very good attribute as long as you are not violating the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your loyalty. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he moves to, um, uh, to Mac Medina and in the first year or according to some in the second year, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima radiallahu anha is married to uh, Ali radiallahu an on the first of Dhul Hijjah. And after 19 days, Fatima radiallahu anha is then, you know, basically she moves into the house of Ali radiallahu anha. So, you know, 
uh, many times we have like a nikah, akt, akt, al kitab is done, and then the consummation or the wedding takes place a little bit later. So both of these happen in the month of Dhul Hijjah, in the first year after Hijjah or maybe second. This is a difference of opinion because some of them, they counted the first year as one. And some of them, they said, well, the first year he came, the second year is when it happened. In the tenth year after Hijrah, what happens in Dhul Hijjah? Tenth year after Hijrah, what happens? The, the last pilgrimage, the only pilgrimage of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, Mecca was conquered in the eighth year. But why did the Prophet ﷺ not make Hajj in the ninth year, but only in the tenth year? Because when Mecca was conquered, there were still a lot of the remnants of the Quraysh. Their practices, among them was the practice that if you came to uh, Mecca from other than Quraysh, and you wanted to make tawaf around the Kaaba, you were not allowed to make tawaf in your own clothes. You must purchase clothes from the Quraysh. That was their business, you know. It's like nowadays you have this where <laughs> you have like some repetition of that going on these days too, right? So you could not buy your own clothes. You had to buy clothes from them. Now many people, clothing used to be very expensive at that time. So those people who could not afford to do it, they used to, they were forced to make the tawaf without any clothes at all. And some of the Sahaba mentioned that the people used to wait until it would get dark and then they would remove everything and they would make tawaf around the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, look at, you know, the blood-sucking nature of these people that they did not allow people to make tawaf around the Kaaba in their own clothes because they wanted to make money from them. This is the time when the Prophet ﷺ came. So, so the ninth year, the Prophet sent Ali radiallahu anh to proclaim that all of these things are now forbidden. Nobody can do any of this stuff anymore. And, you know, there were certain conditions were met. There were some mushrikeen that were still living there. All of that was cleaned up. And the scholar said it was not appropriate for the Messenger of Allah to be making tawaf around the Kaaba, to make hajj, while all of these, stuff was, these things were still happening. So ninth year was the year of cleanup. And Abu Bakr was sent as the leader of hajj. And Ali radiallahu was specifically sent to implement these policies. So the next year the Prophet comes for Hajj and that's when he gives the famous farewell pilgrimage uh, khutbah. And on this day is when the ayah is revealed, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radaytu lakum al-Islam ad Moving on in 17 or 18 Hijra, uh, after Hijra, uh, during the month of Dhul Hijjah, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an conquers Egypt and Alexandria uh, surrenders to him. Uh, this is, of course, during the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. In 23 after Hijra, Umar radiallahu an, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, he steps up to lead the prayer, and a man, Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, who is hiding in the shadows with a dagger which has been dipped, cooked in poison, he, as soon as the Umar radiallahu an starts the salah, he jumps up and he stabs Umar radiallahu anh and cuts his stomach open. And then he runs and he stabs 13 people on his way out. He stabs 13 people on his way out. Seven out of the 13 people he stabbed died. Because this dagger was basically soaking in poison for days. So even if you got a tiny little cut with it, that poison would enter your bloodstream and it would kill you. So... Uh, I guess the, some that survived, you know, maybe they got it like on maybe their hair or, you know, something where it did not enter their bloodstream or something. So they survived, but others, uh, so he stabbed 13 people. Then someone had a cloak and they threw it on him like a net. And he realized that he could not escape anymore, so he stabbed himself and he killed himself at that time. Now, Umar radiallahu anh, he immediately... Uh, as he was stabbed, he did not discontinue the salah. He stepped back and he pulled up the Rahman ibn Auf to continue to lead the salah. And that's why we say that the people who pray behind the imam should be people that if any type of emergency happens, imam breaks his wudu or um, falls unconscious. There have been even cases where the imam dies in salah. So the salah continues. So the second person steps up and leads the salah. And that's why we say that people who pray on a chair who cannot pray normally, should not be immediately behind the imam because if they have to step up, 
then how will they do their ruku and sujood? So uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf continues and finishes the salah, and Omar sits next to him and finishes the salah. And then after that, he appoints a council of six people, with the seventh being his son as a tiebreaker. He said, my son cannot be the Khalifa, but I'm appointing him in case there's a tie, three and three, he will break the tie. Who were the six people? He said, these six people are the six people that the Prophet ﷺ gave the glad tidings of Jannah. These were Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zubair ibn Al-Awwam, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So among these six people, they had to pick one among them. And, the, and Umar said, if in three days they do not select one among them, execute all of them. Subhanallah, this is the wisdom of Umar radiallahu anhu. If you have capable leaders who do not agree on one thing, they will all go and start their own pockets. And there's a following. And you know what? A lot of times the person himself is good. It's the followers that say, you know, you can do it. We are behind you. And that's exactly what they did with Hussein radiallahu anh, right? It was the people that betrayed him. and said, yeah, go ahead and do it. We will support you. And when he arrives there, they say, sorry, we can't do it. Right? They are the ones that set up that trap for him. So... So Umar radiallahu anh, he selects this council of six people and he puts a guard around them. He said they have to decide from among them. And then, of course, they did not come to a tie. Rather, uh, Uthman radiallahu anh, was chosen to be the Khalifa among them. Um, it so happens that after 13, 14 years of Uthman radiallahu anh, uh, ruling, even Uthman radiallahu anh, was uh, killed in Dhul Hijjah. He was killed in Dhul Hijjah as well. And after a uh, siege around his house by these rebels for about 40 days. And of course, Uthman radiallahu anh could have easily taken care of these people. But Uthman radiallahu anh said, I do not want bloodshed in the city of the Prophet in my name. I don't want anyone. Ali radiallahu anh said that Hassan and Hussein are standing here. Other sahaba, they brought their young sons, warrior sons. They said, you're going to stand guard. And we will fight for you. We can take care of these people in like five minutes. Just give us the permission. You are the Amir. He said, no, I don't want anyone to fight for me. To cause bloodshed in the city of the Prophet. And in the month of Dhul Hijjah, one day Uthman radiallahu anh wakes up again under siege. And he is fasting on this day. And he sees a dream. And he sees the Prophet wasallam and Abu Bakr and Umar. And they appear to him in a dream. And they say, oh Uthman, break your fast with us today. Break your fast with us today. And on this day, uh, he woke up and he wore pants. You know, they used to wear what we call lungi. But on this day, he wore pants. Why did he wear pants? Pants as in, you know, two legs sewn separately. Why? Because he knew that when they will come and attack him, if he falls, he may expose his aura. And what was a defining characteristic of Uthman? His haya. His haya. So even when he thinks that he's going to be killed today, he dresses himself properly for the occasion so that his aura will not be exposed. Subhanallah. But of course, they do kill him. And then, of course, in a few days, in the same month of Dhul Hijjah, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh, becomes the next Khalifa to Rashid. He's given the bay'ah by the Muslims. Now, that is close to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, moving towards recent history, I'll share with you some interesting things I found. In 1351 after Hijrah, which is 1933, the first British woman goes for Hajj. And her name is Lady Evelyn Cobbold. And she wrote a book detailing her journey into the Muslim world called Pilgrimage to Mecca. Pilgrimage to Mecca, and that book is available uh, you can see her pictures and her writings and things like that. So in 1933, she is in her 60s, and she is the first British woman to go for Hajj. Uh, in 1964, in 1964, the great uh, leader of the Muslims in America, and really somebody who had so much potential, Malcolm X, rahimahullah, he is the one who goes for Hajj in 1964, which is, of course, uh, just again a few uh, months before he himself is assassinated. 
And if you ever read about Malcolm X, inshallah, we'll talk about him. He's one of the people that, you know, if you're not black, you don't think that I have anything to do with Malcolm X. But really, Malcolm X was an amazing person. And the FBI wrote about him. They said that if he continues to live and lead like he is doing, he can unite the Muslims of the entire world behind him. They saw him as a threat. And recently, a Netflix documentary came out, which is Who Killed Malcolm X? And they say that all signs point towards the authorities, right? It's blamed on the nation of Islam, and maybe they are the ones that pulled the trigger, but who was the one who was instigating behind it? You know, and they, they have that. And they, one of the things they wrote in his file is that whenever somebody was in a very powerful, influential role in public, the FBI, tries, FBI tried to, of course, we don't know what they're doing right now, but, you know, we, we know. But they used to try to put them in a compromising position so they could blackmail them if the time came, if the need came. So they used to send women. I have a question for you. I want to talk to you in private, and it's all a setup. And they wrote in his file that it is, it is as if he doesn't even see these women. He is, you know, mashallah, he's on his top of his game. It's as if he doesn't even see these women exist. Subhanallah. So in 1964, he goes for Hajj. And if you uh, read his story, it's, you know, he did not have any money. His sister sent him on Hajj. And when he went to Hajj, until this time, he was a black supremacist. But when he went to Hajj, he saw that Islam is the solution to the problem of racism, which is that the laws don't matter. It's the hearts that matter. And Islam has given the ideology to the people that superiority is not based on your race, it is based on your taqwa. And he saw that in his tent in Hajj, there was a white man from you know, some other part of the world, blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin. And he said, I did not notice that he felt any type of you know, discomfort by eating with me in the same plate and sleeping in the same tent and traveling everywhere together. You know, as you make new friends in Hajj, he said, you know what? This is the solution. So he came back from Hajj and he formed a new organization called Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And he said, now, until then, he said, I don't want to work with Martin Luther King. I don't want to work with other people. You know, I am what I am. But when he came back from Hajj, he said that anyone who is doing any good work, I'm willing to work with them. I am willing to. It really broadened his horizon. And of course, he went to Egypt, the famous picture in front of the pyramids. And during Hajj, really broadened, uh, really changed him. Uh, in, in 1997, 1417 uh, after Hijra, does anybody remember the Hajj from 1997? Any? What is that? Flood? 1997. The fire. The great fire in Mina. So up until this time, uh, during that time, the tents of Mina were made of fabric, okay? So, of course, when hujaj come, somebody says, Ya, a chi chai oni chai, right? You need some good chai, good tea. You know, you have a little stove, you're cooking chicken karahi and all this stuff going on there. So, of course, it's very easy for something to topple over and all of that. So, a fire started and it basically engulfed all the, almost all the tents of Mina, basically one from another to another to another. And you can imagine how chaotic it must have been. And I am not sure how many people died, but I'm sure many, many people would have died. And of course, until uh, I think 2000s, like 2004, 2005, every year there used to be a stampede in the Jamarat area. And Alhamdulillah, now they have expanded it. They added five levels to it, and they've made it very big. So now you don't have to go to that one tiny little spot where the stampedes used to happen, but rather they, you can go and you can still uh, do that. So that was 1997, a major fire, a deadly fire swept through Mina. In 1441, what happened? 1441, 2020, the shutdown of Hajj. This was something that has never happened before in known history, that no one from outside Mecca was able to make Hajj. So you can imagine, you know, what difficult, it, how difficult it was to see those scenes of the Kaaba being empty, Masjid al-Haram being empty, Masjid al-Nabawi being empty and closed. 
but subhanallah, uh, that was 1441. And now we are in 1443, the launch of the legendary Mutawif platform of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so we will find out next year, uh, you know, how it is, goes down in history. Apparently right now, uh, people are saying that we booked a double room, a husband and wife, and now my wife is in a room with some other man, and some other man's wife is in the room with me. And people, of course, hopefully they can switch, right? Now they say, okay, we go down to find customer service. There's nobody there to talk to. There's nobody there to talk to. All types of mix-ups and people at airplanes, at airports, and their tickets are not paid for by the platform, although they paid for it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for the hujjaj and may Allah accept it from them. These were just some uh, things that I was able to look up, some of the interesting events in the month of Dhul Hijjah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a tawfiq to take advantage of these blessed days. Any last questions or we will end for uh, salah inshallah. Yes. Yeah, so inshallah this Friday we're going to be, this is the day of Arafah. And uh, inshallah we're going to have iftar here as well. And uh, the day after is inshallah going to be Eid. So, so this is a very common question that has come up, which is that we're not supposed to fast single out Friday, right? So we are not singling out Friday. We are singling out the day of Arafah, okay? We are fasting, not because it's Friday, but because it's the day of Arafah. Other than that, we're not supposed to fast only on Friday or only on Saturday, but rather we're supposed to combine other days or something like that. But this is not the case this time. No problem, inshallah, Okay. All right, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah. 